On the 12th of November 2015, I was mustering cattle at Kiana Station. I don't remember what happened. I remember leaving home that morning and I don't remember anything for the next five weeks, but I was in a helicopter accident approximately two o'clock that afternoon. In April 2017, we traveled out back to the remote Northern Territory. This is where Matt Gain had a helicopter crash late 2015, resulting in multiple injuries, including a bad head injury. It took 10 and a half hours to get Matt to hospital. Every Australian, when in trouble, deserves the best chance at having their life saved and having the impact of their illness minimised. Critical care is necessary in every corner of Australia. So it was you know, one of the biggest the biggest jobs of my life. Um, I, there was a stage where I didn't think Matt would make it. I, I looked at Matt and thought, you know, this injuries, I've seen a lot of trauma in my career. I thought, there's no way this guy's gonna make it. Certainly, uh, I mean, he's a hell of a success story. So. The reason that we continue to seek more modern technology and improve uh, service delivery is we're trying to improve patient care, but we're also trying to make things safer. And we're also trying to look for cost efficiencies. And these are three key points that Tilt Rotor Aviation can deliver on. It's really interesting technology and, and how it could really be applied to save lives and improve care in remote Australia. Well, Australia is a very big country. It's very diverse. Um, it's a relatively wealthy country. And I think that Australians expect uh, the best as far as health care and uh, aeromedical transport that's available. You know, we're only going to change the world if someone's actually got the guts to go and do it and have a bloody big idea and actually go and make it happen. Could this rescue have been easier, faster and more efficient using tilt rotor technology? There's not a day goes by where I don't appreciate and be so thankful just how lucky I really am. I had a radio, got them to ring the DMO. I rang the DMO, just said get a chopper here and tried to get that going and then got in the car and drove. Was this your helicopter crash here? Yeah. Somewhere here? It wasn't oh. that far along and in. Oh, I mean, clearly a pretty serious head injury. It was hard really to say without any, you know, obviously I've got bugger all assessment tools out in my little red bag. But, um, you know, he was, the best I got out of him was a moan. So we're here in remote Northern Territory, uh, and this is the site, the very site of Matt Gaines' accident. And we found some particles of stuff on the ground here that were obviously part of the helicopter. So this is obviously where the helicopter was lying right here and um, where I crashed and it's a funny feeling to come back to this spot like my first time back here. I'm very proud of the work that we do and particularly of the people that we work with. I mean I probably take it for granted that if I have an accident in town it's not going to take four hours or two hours for an ambulance to get there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so things would happen straight away, I wouldn't expect that, but perhaps I do. And here we can't expect that. It's we're nine hours drive to a hospital. It's a long way from anywhere. Yeah. And you do what you can. So why should people here suffer any sort of delay in aeromedical access when new technology is about to come on the market that will revolutionise and significantly improve what we can do for the outback? So now I will speak about the most difficult yet amazing retrieval I've ever been involved in. Retrieving our patient Matt from Kiana Station. He was unconscious at the scene with no medical help. Our King Airs, as you know, couldn't land at this airstrip, so I dispatched the helicopter, which was a four and a half hour flight, including a stop in Catherine to refuel on the way. So we got tasked in the afternoon to uh, what we got described as a helicopter crash out at the Kiana Station. It was a mustering helicopter. The only information that we got was that there was a single person in the crash, that they were outside the helicopter and on their side. I 
tried to work out what was the problem and that was the beginning of four hours of an unconscious person just so frightened, not knowing what's making him unconscious. Thus ensured an endless flurry of phone calls locating and getting approval to hijack the paramedic from nearby MacArthur River Mine, put him in a passing mustering chopper and get him to the scene where we only had sketchy sat phone contact with him. Because it was pretty gusty that day, like when me and Timmy were trying to get to you, it was really getting blown around all over the place. In the build up season they call it, so when it's going from the dry season through to the wet season, when the clouds are building up every day and storms are forming, it um, can get very hot out here. I've seen it up to 50 degrees the outside air temperature. And so we've got the crew um, out and, and ready to go and we'll airborne within about 18 minutes um, after getting that information. We flew to Catherine which is an hour and, a, um, an hour and 10 minutes away and then it refueled and dropped some drugs and then for an extra 2 hours and 20 minutes to Kiana Station uh, and with getting little to minimal information on the way. All up it took 240 phone calls to sort the logistics of this retrieval, but at least Matt was now getting some care. It may seem like a relatively simple thing to organise, but in reality it involved calling all the clinics in the area, the local helicopter companies and the mine multiple times to get it sorted. Just stabilise your C-spine, put some high V's in him. He chopped a few trees down because there's a bit of a clearing over there. So the chopper flew and it was incredibly impressive and very exciting. They're really professional, the crew, they're fabulous. So, as soon as the helicopter stopped, we hot unloaded out to the crash site. Uh, we stabilised Matt's pelvis, we checked him straight over the primary survey ABC. Uh, everything was all good and stable at that stage and we made the decision to scoop him onto the helicopter stretcher, into the back of a Polaris buggy, drive to the helicopter and, and get out of there before the weather closed in. So, we were roughly on the ground for about 16 minutes uh, and that was from blades stopping to blades starting turning again. Uh, and just after we took off uh, from the crash site, Matt sort of came through and grabbed my hand uh, and, and, and basically held my hand and looked at me for roughly about 15 to 30 seconds before he then sort of went back unconscious. And at that stage I thought, no, nah, he's going to make it. Light was fading and they had to uh, quickly load Matt onto the helicopter and fly him to nearby MacArthur River Mine where he was stabilised on the tarmac, put in an induced coma and loaded onto the Care Flight King Air, the third aircraft to subsequently take him back to Darwin, where he received definitive care. You know, it's so good. I can never thank you enough. You don't have to. It's a team effort, mate. Yeah, thank oh, you. My pleasure, brother. You know. It's good to see you. Yeah, Love great. and kicking, and yeah. kicking well. It's one of the first times I met back with Matt was um, at a golf day, and, and we took it out and won it, so it was pretty good. <laughs> The goal is to definitely get back in the pilot seat and I'm looking forward to it and I miss it like you wouldn't believe. So we're a not-for-profit, uh, near a medical organisation. We've got a charitable basis as well which uh, helps us to support our operations every year. We've got a 30-year history and started in New South Wales um, with helicopters and we now operate um, jets, turboprop and helicopters all under the one organisation and the one AOC. We do jobs um, internationally. Um, into Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Uh, we do jobs nationally and interstate um, across state borders, um, especially out of Darwin. And, um, and we do jobs locally, of course, in our area of operation. In, the, um, in Care Flight's area of operations up in um, the Northern Territory, so we're responsible on behalf of the Northern Territory Government for the top half of the Northern Territory. We do 3,500 patient retrievals a year. So that's at a rate of about 10 a day. It's a fairly busy service. We cover an area of about 600,000 square kilometres, so it's an interesting model how different it is in Australia. You know, the, in Sydney with a population of uh, four and a half odd million, there's about seven helicopters and various other assets online, including one of ours, to service that population in a very dense area. Aeromedicine in Australia is currently built around a population-based approach, and that's completely opposite to the principle of equity. What equity requires is that we do more for those who are vulnerable and isolated 
to improve their access so that they might experience a similar level of service. We're servicing a population at most of 170,000, of which 120,000 live in the Darwin urban area. So unless they've ventured out of that area, they're covered by ambulance. So it's a completely different model. You know, we're really servicing about 50,000 people in an area about uh, half the size of New South Wales. The Care Flight is an experienced aeromedical provider in remote Australia and they operate across two states and they operate both fixed wing and rotary wing platforms. They are the experts to inform effective implementation of tilt rotor aeromedicine. I had a look at the tilt rotor in Philadelphia and I think they're an ideal unit for Australia uh, and given their speed, their carrying capacity and the fact that they can actually land anywhere, um, I think it's a no-brainer to have them here in the aeromedical sector in this country. Well, particularly anything unconscious or head injuries, I mean, time is of the essence, you know. Uh, so yeah, I mean, but it, it doesn't matter really, any any injury, you know, the whole golden hour rule still applies. We can't, I can't apply it out here, but you know, the sooner the better is always gonna be the case. Tilt Rotor Aeromedicine is a simple solution to a previously complex problem. I will say that this was an actual mission, and so I did put the actual mission times in. Now there was incoming weather, I know, and there were some issues on the ground, so please, I'm not, I am very aware I'm not comparing apples to apples here, but this is just to give you some idea. What happened here is that they launched a fixed wing uh, out to the uh, runway at MacArthur River Mines and they launched a helicopter to go and do the rescue from Kiana, which was a small helicopter that had crashed in the bush. So they, the helicopter had to stop and refuel on the way. Um, and then when it got there, they put the casualty into the helicopter, flew the helicopter to the River Mines runway where the fixed wing was. And they transferred it between the helicopter and the fixed wing and then flew the casualty back to Darwin. How we could have done it in 609? Well, we wouldn't have had to stop in Tyndall on the way to get pick up fuel, so we could have gone straight down there. Um, we would probably have had to use our auxiliary tanks to get three hours in order to maintain the fuel reserves. And I know they were dealing with inter-weather uh, minimums. The helicopter crew didn't have enough duty hours to return to Darwin that night, so we had to organise accommodation and food for them at MacArthur River Mine. And we also had to organise, as you saw, for the King Air to come down and meet the team and take Matt back to Darwin. Then the next day we also had to organise the return of the helicopter as well. It was a massive task with, task with a fantastic outcome. It feels pretty amazing to know that Matt's alive and well today and will hopefully be back flying in the next couple of years. So there are the timings. Darwin to Kiana and then on the ground for the actual rescue. Uh, and then Kiana to the, to the mines. We would have had to take fuel but we wouldn't have to change aircraft. The casualty is already in the aircraft. When you're doing an aeromedical rescue, such as for Matt Gain, which involves multiple aircraft, multiple people um, in an austere location, there are so many things that can go wrong. He is lucky to be alive, thanks to the amazing efforts of those on the ground at Kiana, MacArthur River Mine and Careflight. So modern aeromedicine in Australia is no longer about bringing the patient to the intensive care unit. It's about bringing the intensive care unit to the patient and we need to pick the right tool for the right job to enable us to do that. In remote areas of Australia, that is very challenging and tool rotor technology is gonna bridge that gap for us. If it's uh, some kind of injury that requires sea level, we can pressurize the aircraft down, keep the aircraft pressurized at sea level. And so for somebody with a head injury, from a medical perspective, having a, a pressurized cabin will add value to their care. Both state and federal government have it on their agenda to improve rural and remote health. And it's important also that we're continuing to work to close the gap. State governments have limited budgets and federal government has a national overview of Australia across state borders. We're trying to promote that the federal government should take a financial interest in funding tilt rotor aeromedicine because of the national scope of this technology and the ability to provide a comprehensive service with economy of scale across state borders. So when I started my career I started off at Metropolitan Sydney working at the Children's Hospital in Ramwick uh, and my, my experience with retrieval there was from 
and a helipad to helipad from hospitals that I could see from our place. There was from road accidents within 30 kilometres away from the hospital. Um, moving to the Northern Territory and coming up here, you realise how much of a massive difference it is on a whole different level. Like it's not just about flying from helipad to helipad, it's flying from the back of someone's property to the helipad or flying from the middle of a road in the middle of nowhere to a helipad. Uh, you know, I can explain it like one of the jobs that I did, um, we, we travelled the same distances from Westmead Hospital to Sydney Arbour Bridge 800 times. We, I've done, uh, we've, we've done jobs up here where we've gone from Darwin all the way down to Alice Springs and back, which is covering half of Australia. And that's one helicopter. You now I've worked in Sydney where, you know, you, luckily you might have a fair few helicopters that fly around and be able to do that sort of stuff, but we've got the one to cover that whole area. So when you think about that in the bigger picture, and you think about the people that are out in those locations, like I, I didn't know what it was like. I worked in the emergency department surrounded by, you know, clinicians, consultants, other nurses, many, many practitioners. Then working out in the middle of nowhere, out bush into these remote areas, driving 50, 60 kilometers to car crashes, and then having to wait nearly, you know, six to seven hours for, the, for aeromedical support to come through. You, you, you base yourself on your, your skills and the teams that arrive. So, the distances that we travel for the patients that we want to pick up, that's what makes a difference. Like everything in the Territory, it's a long way. You know, in that time of the year, after having a few showers on the roads, you know, you get fast rain and big dumps, a couple inches in an afternoon, it starts creating washouts and roads are impassable sometimes for the year. And the rain uh, has its effects on the airstrips. And we've had that a number of times where know that we've been asked to drive people into medical services and I just flat out refuse and wait. Yeah. Prefer to wait because of the pain of the patient or with an unconscious person if there's suspected spinal, you just don't want to move people. And it's very remote, like um, it would be close to being one of the remotest plate corners in the Territory, wouldn't it? Like very close to it. Yeah, it is pretty remote here. We're a long way from services and, and what people take for granted. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Whereas out here, obviously, you're going to be hours, hours and hours. But the other thing here, the other thing that really grabs us and that we identify with as a business is the idea of big dreams and passionate people with a big purpose. To first run a trial for aeromedicine using the tilt rudder out of Wellcamp Airport and then expanding the fleet and being able to offer a more comprehensive national remote aeromedical service. So we developed uh, WellCamp uh, in 2012. Uh, we received approval and uh, had it operational in 2014. Toowoomba is the second biggest inland city in Australia after Canberra. We didn't have that connectivity that we needed not only for business uh, but for tourism and also for health and education. First one that's been built in this country in 50 years since Tullamarine in Melbourne and it's the first one that's ever been built in this country without any government financial assistance. The brand message is, is not just about the physical ability that we have to help people get to where they're going but also that conceptual idea, the, the, the world of opportunity that sits out there and how a major piece of aviation infrastructure like Toowoomba Wellcamp Airport connects people to those opportunities all around the world. Toowoomba is a service centre for Western Queensland and services uh, the Bowen Basin, the Surat Basin and the Cooper Basin and soon to be the Galilee Basin. So we think it is ideally suited. We don't have a curfew at Wellcamp. Uh, we don't have the traffic issues that the capital city airports do. We've got a very high skill base in both the aeronautical sectors and the health sectors. We could easily do uh, not only just the aeromedical but also the um, search and rescue operations out of World Camp. I spent a lot of time working in the southeast corner of Queensland where we were blessed with the opportunity to have access to uh, fast access to helicopter rescue services. For me it was one thing to move from a, a coastal parametropolitan area to remote Australia and be confronted as a doctor with the challenges in getting critical care delivery organised um, and the added complexity and the time delays and everything that's involved. Completely different experience and far more confronting being the parent of a child that's sick um, and trying to reassure myself that she's going to be okay. When 
you're waiting for help to come. Every minute seems like an hour. So I can only imagine what it's like for patients and their families while they wait hours. So, so the use of uh, aviation technology to deliver urgent and critical patient care into remote and rural Australia is something I personally really get. It's important to me. I think it's important that we never reach a point of complacency or contentment uh, where we say, okay, we're, it's good enough now. It makes things easier for us, that we could save a life or try our hardest to and then be in an even better position to achieve that. We choose to live in the middle of nowhere, so you know, you, you do choose to try and look after yourself and look after the people around you and take accountability for that. Yeah. And anything on top of that is a bonus, really. Yeah. But we're growing beef for the whole country and the nation and the export trade and other things and you know that not everybody wants to do that. Yeah. It's just lucky that we love it. The more the better. It's a big open space and we don't have much in our to help us out. Country folk are some of the nicest people you will ever meet. They're humble, they're generous, they're hospitable. They are hard working, well meaning, deserving Australians. I've been to five funerals of helicopter pilots. And you know, half an hour could make the difference even, and it's, it's big. And I think that if we can even save minutes, it's worth it. But with Tilt Rotor technology, it's clear to me that we're going to be able to save hours, and we're going to even be able to cut that wait time in half for some cases. Absolutely worthwhile to provide that service to people in their time of vulnerability and crisis, and to come to their rescue, and to give them everything that they deserve as Australians, the best that we can offer to help improve their care. Except we, you know, we just doubled resources because we have to do the switch over. And, yeah. You know, and it also takes time then. And you've got to marry up somewhere else and whatever. If you're on a tilt road and you get to the spot you want to go. Yeah. Pick up and be gone. Yeah. And sort of realising how much difference they will make for patient care. I feel very passionate about trying to do what I can to push this agenda and spread the word that we need to get our teeth into this and work towards making this future available for our children when they're older and for their children in years to come. Knowing that there will always be people in need of saving right across our country will never do it perfectly. But we should aim for excellence and we should never stop refining and improving what we're doing. It's one of the best examples to the world of how civilian tilt rotor technology can improve the human condition. And so we have a special opportunity here to lead the world in what we're doing. Yeah, I reckon that we should really fight for this and push for it because it's not just about bringing something new to Australia. It's something that I believe that we really need. It's our future and we just can't get it soon enough. <laughs>